Hello and welcome to our Friday webinar. Um, we are doing what episode of the Gray Way is this? Um, hmm, it's got to be up there, like 18? 18. 18? 18. Our 18th episode of the Gray Way with Lisa Bono. Uh, thank you for joining us for episode 18. Uh, Lisa, I hope you're doing well. Um, yes, thank you. I see your beautiful cages there in the background, or your, your trees and your cages and your happy birds. <laughs> Yes, yeah, so if you have, everybody sees me moving around, it's because I'm sitting on the hardwood floor. And I'm sure it's not going to be very comfortable, but I wanted the birds behind me in their cages so everybody can see that it's, you know, a fun place for them to be. What's funny is it almost looks like one of those virtual backgrounds. It's like so pristine. <laughs> <laughs> this looks like one of those, like one I would download and have behind me. But, um, <laughs> oh, man. Okay. So, uh, oh, a couple things. So, if anyone's looking for for Brenda on our chat, she she's she's not with us today, but um, but uh, but I'm she wishes everyone a wonderful Friday as usual and welcome everybody. Uh, today happens to be Cinco de Mayo, so uh, hola. <laughs> and um, I wish I had some like some festive background, but I will tell you this um, while we wait for people to log on. Do you know how many, I had to Google this because I wasn't I knew some of these species, but not all. But how, guess how many, if anyone can guess, um, uh, how many species are endemic to Mexico? Hmm. Parrot species. I'm parrot species, species of parrot. Does anybody know the answer to that? I'll let it go in the chat. Let's see, anyone know how many species of parrot? Okay, um, how about this? Uh, raise your hand if you think it's uh, 10. <laughs> I'll just round up the numbers, about 10. Um, okay, how about 15? 20. All right. If you hit 20, you got to go a little bit above it. There's 22 species, apparently, that are endemic to Mexico. Um, of course, Amazons are probably like the most familiar ones. Um, there's also just going down this list real quick. Um, there are a bunch. Uh, let's see. We've got, I see macaws, um, scarlet macaw, military macaw. Thick billed parrot. Those are a little more rare. Uh, maroon fronted parrot. So I guess that's I'm gonna maroon fronted parrot. I guess that that's not a conure. That looks like an Amazon. Um, white fronted Amazon. Yellow lord parrot. Another Amazon. Uh, red crown parrot. Another Amazon. Uh, lilac crown. Amazon. Yellow cheeked. Amazon. Northern mealy parrot. The yellow head or the double yellow head. Um, of course. A uh, yellow naped parrot is also from there. So is the white crown parrot. I think the, when they're saying parrot, these all look like Amazons to me. Brown hooded parrot. Um, huh. Green green parakeet. I'm guessing it's a conure. Uh, some things I haven't heard of, a Socorro parakeet. Looks like another conure, Pacific parakeet. Okay, I go on and on, but there are, tw there are 22. Uh, orange fronted um, parakeet. That is like an orange fronted conure, so. There we go. Um, but 22 species. <laughs> In and and my, fa my favorite uh, Amazon, the orange wing. That's got to be I in there somewhere. What, what's that? That's got to be in there somewhere. Yeah, I'm sure it is, right? Um, if yeah. not, somebody correct me. <laughs> <laughs> but So uh, one thing you'll notice is there are no African grays endemic to Mexico. <laughs> so, correct. So those are... Uh, they're, if, they're, if I'm correct, uh, those are old, grays are old world species, right? And then am, like the ones that would be endemic to Mexico are more like the new world species, right? It's, yes. Okay. All right. Yes. There we go. That was in honor of Cinco de Mayo. Um, <laughs> so I am sure you are going to PowerPoint present for us, I hope. because always... Yes, I have a good PowerPoint today and I'm ready whenever you are. Okay. Uh, looks like we have everybody. Um, all right. So if we have any time for questions, um, we'll do it towards the end. And of course, please use the Q&A button and not the chat feature if you do have a question for Lisa. So on that note, I'm going to leave it uh, over to you. OK, sounds good. Here we go. Oh, no screen share first. That would be helpful. <laughs> OK, got to move a couple things out of the way. Just give me a second. No worries. And I know everybody's probably wondering what's going on, but I have all these things that pop up and I have to move yeah. them around so I can see my own presentation. 
In the meantime, right. you know, um, someone pointed out, thank you, Adrian, that parakeet and conure have been um, used interchangeably for some species. So that's absolutely correct. You'll hear people say, um, you know, conure and, and, and par um, sorry, like green cheek parakeet or green cheek conure, but they're the same. I think parakeet just means small bird with long tail, technically. <laughs> so. For a lot of people, yep. Yeah. So, so it's always fun trying to figure out what somebody's talking about when they would come into the into the store. Yeah. So um okay, so I want to welcome everybody to the 18th edition of the Gray Way series. Thank you all for being part of this and for sending in your pictures and allowing me to use them. So we're going to talk about blinging that cage today, but we're going to go a little bit farther because we just don't want to have the cage. We want to have the environment. So we're going to talk about the optimum environment as well as the cage that's in there. So a lot of people consider having birds in cages some sort of punishment. And if you look at that cage and I, that, that little cartoon just actually tore up my heart because we all don't want to think about it, but we realize there's a lot of birds that are sitting there like that. And of course, you got to look at that as some sort of punishment because that's not a life. So you know, I want to look at their cage of more of a personal space for them, just like we have our own personal space where we're comfortable. Maybe it's our chaise lounge. Maybe it's our bedroom. We like to retreat. We like to go there. We like to relax. So that's the way we're going to look at this presentation. A lot of people will talk about their birds never being caged, and then they'll go on, you know, months later, years later to say, oh, my bird sleeps under the cabinet, and I get attacked every time I walk by, or, you know, my guard, my bird guards the kitchen sink or the bathroom and don't fly to attack. Well, if you have a bird that is never caged and doesn't know his little boundaries and really doesn't know not right for wrong, um, it's going to become harder to work with them, and they're mo less likely to respond to requests and cues. So what favors are you actually doing by letting your bird free roam? None. Mm. So I just want to say that Zippy is one of my stars. Obviously, Zippy has a very nice cage and he has a wonderful life. It was just an appropriate cute picture for me to throw him in there because I like to use him. So free range is for chickens, not for parrots. Too much can go wrong if you're constantly, you know, have the bird out and he's not under supervision. They could chew on things. They can destroy things. Um, they become a little bit more reambunctious. A cage should be a fun, safe place to be in. It builds independence for younger parrots. I can't stress that enough. And offers security to an older one. Now, a lot of people will get babies and they're constantly holding them or carrying around or letting them be on the floor or all these little cute things for these little empty shelled babies who don't know anything, have no hormones. They just want to follow you around. It's cute. I'll admit it. But what happens if you continue that sort of lifestyle and then your lifestyle changes and all of a sudden your bird has to be put in a cage or you have guests coming over and a bird has to be put in a cage or then, then you have issues because then the bird doesn't understand what's going on. It's going to be screaming. It's going to be carrying on. And then it's, it's stress for everybody involved. Now here is Sammy and I'm going to try something different with the with the sound on here to see if we can actually get it to play. Uh, it's actually with the Zoom background and nothing that we are doing. So this is Sam. She's in her cage. And you can tell. Let's see if it's going to work. I don't know if you can hear anything. She's not really talking, but you'll hear the other birds. She's preoccupying herself. She doesn't need me to carry her around. She's got her swing. She has her, you know, her toys. And she is perfectly fine in there. So boundaries and rewards. And the way I want to look at this is if your bird is in the cage and, you know, in the morning with my own guys, I'll go into their sleep room. I'll take them out. I'll get them up on my hand. They want to come out because they want to go in their own room. They want to be on their trees. So there is absolutely no fuss of them getting out or coming right on my hand and going into the room. So actually coming out of the cage is a reward in itself. Everybody always talks about reward with food or reward with praise or reward with something. The physical being of coming out of the cage and going somewhere else where the bird wants to be 
that is also a reward. So, you know, if you have your bird and he's in the cage and, you know, he's happy and he's content in there, and then it's time to come out because I like to feed my guys outside their cages in regards to their nightly dinners with their, their, with their chopper, I call it mash. Um, I don't feed that in the cage. I take them out. They go on their play stands. They know they're going to come out, go on their play stands. It's time for dinner. There's no issues getting them in and out. So it gets into a routine. People don't like that word, but I'm going to use it. They, they get into the routine and knowing that's what's going to happen. So you have your, your boundaries of them being in their cage and being good little birdies, occupying themselves and the reward of them coming out and being with you and, and doing whatever you want to do. So this episode, we're going to discuss how to make good cage and environments for any species bird. It's not as easy as just buying a cage, buying a bird, throwing some toys in there and say, here you go and expect the bird to thrive because it's not going to. So I want everybody to grab their pens and pencils, and get ready, their little notebooks and start taking some notes. This was created by Neil for me and I really appreciate it. I think it's adorable. So our goal is to help the birds enjoy their own little private area. This means everything from toys and perch claimant to activities that can be offered in the cage and around the cage. So we're gonna try to touch on all of that. And that's Sydney in his cage. You can see um, you know, mainly all his toys hanging up front. Um, I think he was getting ready to come out with me right there. So he was standing in the front. He was cueing me to tell me it's time. First thing you have to do is you have to get proper cage construction. So you have to decide for whatever species birds you have, you're getting the right cage. Cage size is very important um, for several reasons. First off, you don't wanna have a cage that's too small for the bird not to be able to move around, to not have adequate toys, perching, activities. And you don't want to have something that is so monstrous that you cannot get it out of your house to clean properly. And I don't think people realize that when they hear bigger, 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 better, better, better. I try to steer people towards a cage that they can fit through their door so the cage is cleaned properly versus this monster in the corner that they physically have to take apart every time to take it out, side to clean. And that's not gonna happen as much as you think it does. So you wanna make sure you are able to take it apart on a, on a good basis or stay with something that is manageable for the help of your bird. Now, this is Miss Jenny. This is a cage that I just sent out to a client and we upgraded her and we were that was the first time she was in the cage the toys aren't in there yet, but it shows a good size for her. Maintenance-wise, a great size for the owner. So if with the cages, when you're looking, if you don't have an exterior play gym, you can get a play top. So the bird can come out, you can hang things over there. Um, and you can even take the tray off the top if you want. You can put a piece of plexiglass down, zip tie it in place, put the plexiglass down, make sure it's not sharp. This way the sun is coming through. Um, it's not dark and dingy under the tray up top, but yet if they're pooping, they're not landing on the cage, just make sure it's not in direct sunlight so the sun's not being amplified on the bird. If you have a dome top, um, I prefer dome tops or cathedrals. The dome top goes has the arch side to side. The cathedral has it from front to back. The cathedral cage gives it a little bit more room. And I'll go back one slide to show you what I mean. Um, that I would suggest for birds that do come out a lot, do have another area to go play on, and you want a little bit more room in their cage. So the first cage going back, the first cage is going to be uh, the cathedral. The arch is from the front to the back. And then you have um, the third one over. That is going to be a dome. It goes side to side, just so you know what we're talking about. I don't ever want to see or hear of a cage like you see posted up there in the corner. I don't even know who makes it. Um, that is totally inappropriate, really, for anything um, other than maybe one little tiny finch. 
So appropriate size for a cockatiel, as you can see, is the one that I have on the right there. That I don't know who that person is, but that's actually a very excellent setup because if you look down around the bottom where the tray is, you can see that they took palm leaves. Um, they're usually by, uh, I think, Planet Pleasures. And you can weave them in and out of the cage bars. Um, she did that along the, the middle and it did it on the bottom. So that gives the bird something to chew on down there as well. It looks good. It's more entertainment for the bird. The bird has a ton of stuff to do in there. And it looks like a great setup. So that's why I chose that one to sit in there. Now, this is Sammy um, for all you gray people. Uh, for your Amazons, your smaller cockatoos, probably, I'm talking like maybe the Goffins, um, you know, that size, you can do a 36 by 24. That happens to be what my guys are in. I do like that size. I can physically move these cages out for proper cleaning on my own. So I know that they're being taken care of. I also do the cathedral because you can see my guys have play stands. So they can come and go, um, you know, and play on either one. This is actually a pretty cool cage that one of my friends had made. And this is an acrylic cage they made for uh, Captain Morgan and Tyler. And this is a great way to show how a cage is set up because you don't have the typical bars for the bird to be able to move around on. So you can see all these ropes hanging down. So if the bird gets on the floor, he can grab the rope, he can climb up, he can get to the PVC for his uh, food, and then he can climb up another rope and he can get to the perch in the back, which then leads him to the swing that's hanging there, which hangs him to another rope to get to his round circle or his swing up in the corner. So there's a lot of thought that goes into a cage like this. So if the bird gets down, they can get back up. That floor is wonderful. It looks like the same thing I have in my bird room, which cleans up super easy. And that's a great setup if you have um, a, an acrylic type cage. Again, the ventilation is on the top. I'm not sure if it's anywhere else because I have not seen this cage in person, but this is probably something you don't want in direct sunlight like my room because it would get really hot. But then again, she might have some kind of cooling system there that I cannot see. So next thing is perches. It's important to have and offer different perches of various textures and components. This is good for their foot health. Just imagine, uh, I, I love my shoes, I love my cowboy boots, I love my heels. But if I had to wear the same pair of heels 24 seven for the rest of my life, I would probably hate them. So just like with our feet, we wanna move them, we wanna have them in different positions. It's good for their foot health. This way they can move their toes, they can move around. Um, it's easier for grooming, it's easier for eating. And you just, you wanna offer a whole bunch of different textures, again, because it's just better for their feet. Um, I hear a lot of people say, just get some sticks and put them in there. There's so much more to a perch than just a stick being put in there. Perches that don't go all the way across promotes climbing and more exercise. So the, the typical cages are gonna come with two dowels and it's up to us to really furnish them with the rest. So when people were getting the cages through me, I'd walk them through all the, the different perch options and tell them, you'd like to have this, you'd like to put it here. If the bird wants to get to the next perch, he's got to climb off the perch onto the cage, move around to get to the other perch. You don't want to have one big long perch in there, just make it easy to go side to side. That's not exercise. Again, it's the same diameter perch. It's the same consistency. You want to make sure they're getting exercise in the cage. Okay, so here we have Abby and you can see that she has all various different size perchings in there that she can climb onto. She cannot get directly from the front to the back or side to side without climbing around and being an acrobat. And she's very good with it despite her being ill. Now you'll see down by the food dishes, the bottom right-hand side, that is actually one of the dowels that would have came, come in the cage. And I prefer to use a dowel next to the food dish because one, when it gets dirty, you can throw it out and you can get another one very cheaply, um, even if you have to go to Home Depot and have it cut to fit the cage versus having an expensive perch that is harder to wipe and clean and you might not get everything off. So 
that's how I do my cages. Those those are disposable perches for me. And if the birds chew on them, it's fine. There are several types of perches, even flat perches for arthritic and special abled birds. They have different corner pieces you can put in there. Um, this is Thumper. Thump, you guys should be familiar with Thumper. His um, parents, we believe, chewed off his little feet, um, being a little happy and preening when he was a little one. So his cage needs are just a little bit different. And so the thicker, flatter perches, uh, there are companies that make them. And this is this is wonderful. It gets the bird up off the ground and it gives, you know, you can hang toys around versus them always being on the bottom of the cage or even the wire corner pieces that their feet are gonna fall through. Perch placement is very important. The birds should be able to reach the food easily. They shouldn't be hunched over if they're sitting on their top perch because their head is hitting the top of the cage. They shouldn't be stand or sitting straight up because their tail is hitting the back of the cage or their wings are too close to the side of the cage because the perch is too small. You have to make sure that you're, you're, you're optimizing where the perch is and what is the best job the perch can do. So this is easy, as you can see, that he's standing there and he's actually holding the food in his hand and he can stand on a perch and he's comfortable. And then when he decides to drop that, he just has to reach in for more. I've seen cages that were set up where the people did not even have perches near the bowls, which means the bird either has to hang on the side of the cage or stand on a very um, you know, skinny little bowl rim which can't feel good on their feet. Uh, so you want to make sure there's something there that makes their food bowl and their toys accessible. So you want to look for successful toys. And I've done a webinar on, on here. It is on the Lefebvre's YouTube channel. So we won't go crazy with all the different types of toys because that is out there. And I urge you to look at it if you have not. But you want to make sure you're finding out what toys your birds like. You have to purchase the proper toys, otherwise they're not going to be used. You're going to think your bird doesn't like toys. You wasted your money and you have a bored bird. So what I do a lot of times with my packages for my clients is if they have a baby, I'll start out with smaller, safe toys which my Emma, who's who's special abled and is afraid of a lot of big toys, or her body language shows that she is not comfortable being around them, um, trying to be proper here. Uh, she has taught me what toys that she likes that are smaller, which we start the babies on. And if you start a baby on the smaller toys, then they're not they're, they tend not to be as frightened, and you can move them up to a larger toy and you'll know what they like. You don't need to go out and spend a $60 toy to find out that your bird doesn't like it. You, you start out with a small toy that's maybe five of the same material and see if, the, if your bird goes over it. So here's Abby, this may have been her birthday and she had a whole bunch of toys that we put in there. And of course she went to her forager, that's her favorite forager out of everything for her uh, senior Nutriberry. So here are some of the toys uh, that I have found, especially with grays, that they like. Now, some of the toys on the bottom, and I will go over them, um, are going to be for your smaller, smaller birds. But one toy does not fit all. I have a story of when I was in the store, I had a lady come in and she had bought an Amazon. It was a larger Amazon. And uh, she, I did not sell birds. Um, she bought it someplace else. She bought the cage somewhere else. And she came in and she wanted to buy some toys. So we went over to my toy wall and we went through and I showed her, you know, what would, what would be appropriate, what my Amazons at home liked. And she looked at it and I have to tell you, my prices were very low in comparison to most stores because my competitors were Petco, Petco and PetSmart. So I had to be in that price range. So, but I had small mom and pop companies that I worked with. So it was something you might not see. So it was probably in the range of maybe $9.99 for this toy. And I suggested, why don't you try this? The bird's still young. They might like this. It's got different textures. We'll know what you like. And she looked at the price and she says, I'm not spending 10 bucks on this bird. And mm -hmm. I'm thinking, what? 
you know, you, you there's toys out there that are upwards of a hundred a piece. This is 10 bucks. And she went to a parakeet toy and she said, this will do. It was a dollar 99. I said, no, I won't sell that to you. It's an inappropriate toy for your rather large Amazon, whether it's a baby or not, it's not appropriate. So um, she was not happy with me. She stormed out of the store and I never saw her again. And I just hoped that the bird did well. I didn't know how else to handle myself, but I was not going to sell an inappropriate toy. I wish more places were like that. Um, I did. I at my store, I chose the safe and the best products for you, not all the products for you. So you want to make sure when you're getting a toy that you're looking to make sure the components are going to be appropriate for your size bird. Obviously, the toy that's up in the top left corner, that's going to be your macaw. It's going to be your cockatoo. Um, below that is a little arch. I know um, Shelly and Tig are watching. Um, Tig's favorite toy is that arch down there. Um, that is a softball, so he loves that. So, you know, that's something she wants to keep in his cage or, or offer often. Now, I also have the toy that's all the way to the right, and it's it's enlarged. That is actually a toy no bigger than a cockatiel. And the reason I highlighted that one, because you can see by the beads that are on there, they're translucent. And not a lot of companies use these anymore. I wish they did. Maybe they're just harder to find. But your cockatiels in particular love the translucent beads. So that's why that's highlighted. So something like that with a cockatiel will last the entire life of your bird. Um, usually something like that. I know that company is stainless steel and um, they just, you know, the, they love the translucent beads. It's harder to find for the bigger guys. The, the African grays tend to like acrylic. Uh, my Amazons, not so much, but my guys, uh, you know, with the acrylic, they would like that as long as it was a thicker acrylic, because you still have to be careful. They still can break them. And then you have your foraging toys, and you can see they're for all different sized birds. Um, some birds like them better than others. Not all foraging toys have to be acrylic. As you can see by the one that's a box there, that's that's a good one to have. Um, you just got to keep making the box and filling it up. And the one in the middle with the gray and that little foraging ball, that is actually an excellent toy. And that ball can come off to be used as a foot toy. And you can put your, you can use the top as a skewer to put, say, your peppers and whatever else you, in big chunks you want to put up there. So it's called a buffet ball, ball. And a lot of birds really do like that one as well. So these are all things that when a bird is in their cage, if it's the right treat, something they like, they will use it. Sometimes you can put um, larger beads in there and they like just the noise of it. I have one toy that my guys have never used as a forager, but they love when the big plastic beads are in there so they can hit it and make noise. Mm -hmm. Toy placement is very important. So I see a lot of cages pictures of uh, on the internet where people hang their toys up. And unfortunately, toys are just hung on the top of the cage and there's no perch near it. So again, the bird either has to hang upside down to get to the toy or hang on the side of the cage and, and get the toy. That's not fun. Just imagine if that's how you got to stand there or cook or do your laundry sideways. Um, you know, it's, it's not a lot of fun. You're not going to want to do it. So you have to make sure that there's an easy spot for them to rest and be able to play. If you have a softer toy, um, like if I'm, if I'm using balsa, I'm not gonna necessarily put a piece of balsa on the side of Sterling or Abigail's cage because then they can lean into that balsa, put their foot up on the side of the cage while they're sitting on their perch and have that balsa gone in five minutes. And some of those toys are a little costly. So, you know, I might as well just give them a $20 bill. So what I'll do is I'll take that balsa and I'll move that out into the, in the middle of the cage. They, they absolutely can still reach it sitting on a perch, but that balsa is moving as they're trying to get it compared to them pinning it to the side of the cage and just destroying it. So that's what you have to think about. If it's something that is a harder wood, you want to put that against the side of the cage so they have a way to lean into it and destroy it.
Softer stuff can be hung from the middle. So it's a little bit harder to get their beak on and maybe lasts a little bit longer. So here we have Sky, and that was one of the Easter um, boxes I had made up. And you can see he's comfortably standing on the perch, one foot on the toy. The toy is against the back of the cage because it is a harder wood. And he's able to access that easily. He's not stretching, you know, he's not straining, and he's more off to play with it if it's easy. So here we have Susan, and again, I have the same same sort of setup for Emma with the corner perch, and I actually have a little toy box in there for her, and we'll go over those uh, later in the presentation as well. Um, but Susan likes to have her little corner there, and those are some of her favorite toys, and that's where she's comfortable. Again, those are harder toys. She can lean into them. She can chew them. If you look behind her, uh, on her back there, you can see a little cup. It looks like Susan has a little um, little toy box there. And again, we'll get into that, but that looks like all the little pieces she already chewed off or put into a box. Here she is traveling. Um, so I think she was getting ready to go into motor home with her parents. And again, you can see there's a box there with a little wooden reed ball in there. Uh, that is softer. She went for that more easily. And then you can see the harder toy against the cage so she can chew. And the perch is accessible. Uh, Susan also had some medical issues. So that's that's part of the collar there. Um, she does, she has very specific dietary needs. And when she gets into something she shouldn't, we have a little bit of wing flipping, toe tapping, and she mutilates. So she has a very good working relationship with her doctor. And that collar is... Um, people put these collars on all the time. Um, I want you to talk to your vet before you do anything like this. Your vets work with some really great companies that might be small mom and pops that are making special felt ones. Um, or you might need the special, you know, cone of shame like this if they can get around it. Or there's other collars as well. But please just don't go out and stick them on your bird and expect your bird to thrive. It should be something you want to discuss with your vet to make sure nothing's wrong. Now here we have Emma. And this is actually a smaller toy that I had to take some some pieces off of. Uh, but she, like I said, does not like bigger toys. You can see the perch is right there and she can have her foot up on the toy, she can destroy it and it's right next to the cage. So that toy really doesn't last long because she has access to it and it's comfortable for her to destroy. And here we have Abby. So her toys are hanging more in the middle because uh, she does destroy stuff very quickly. And this was uh, the cage that she came in. We've upgraded her cage a little bit because this is a little tiny for an extremely active little bird. Uh, so she got into a bigger stainless steel and this is now Emma's cage. And so the larger perches that you see going all the way across are no longer in use. She has, like I showed you before, all the different perches she has to climb around and keep her active. So I think the only thing that stayed similar uh, with this cage she's in now in her new cage is going to be that yellow swing back there in a the corner. That's her favorite. She looks like a giant stuffed cockatiel on a, on a tiny little uh, swing. She's too big for it. Um, now here we have Zippy again. Not sure. Oh, there he is. I see him on the perch. Uh, this is a great way to show you that Zippy has foraging things in here. Now, it looks like there might be some food on the top one. You can see is where he's sitting. The perch is right there. There's toys against the side of the cage. She, he's got some other perches that are down lower to get around the cages. And then down on the floor, there's another foraging wheel that looks like there's some toy parts in there. So this is all going to keep him busy and occupied. While you have your toys in the cage, I have to make sure that you check these little holders. Um, I check mine really at night. I check them every night before I cover the bird's cages to make sure that nobody's gonna be hung up or stuck on them in the morning. Um, I check them you know, usually once or twice a week in the bigger cages. 
I use a plier on mine. I know my guys are stronger than I am. Um, I try to use the bigger links versus the smaller links. The so smaller links can really do some damage if you know they get caught underneath the beak or underneath you know their band or stuff like that. So you do have to be careful. You have to have good husbandry. No matter the toy, you also have to make sure that you watch to make sure there aren't pieces on the toys that can cause damage. Now, this is a brand new toy. And I didn't notice that until I zoomed in on it for the webinar. So I took my little handy plier and I closed it more so she can't get caught on that. Um, so you need to make sure, even though it, it's, it's a very good, safe toy company, you just need to be vigilant and watch on your own. And if you, if you insist on using rope toys, make sure that any of the frayed rope, the hanging strings are trimmed regularly or even changed out because the birds can ingest it. And that's that lovely little pellet looking thing there after surgery that being taken out because the bird was pulling on that and ingesting it. So I will use ropes and stuff really on the outside of the cages. I have used them in, as an emergency if I was moving the birds around and they had to be on it for, say, a week or so until I got another one. But I like to monitor all my boings and ropes and stuff like that outside the cage. When you're hanging your toys, you got to make sure you don't have excessive chain hanging down that they can get excited and hit and it swing back and get caught around their neck and then you know, them panic with this heavier toy being you know wrapped around their neck. So you can see how I kind of maneuvered the long chain up out of the cage and around the side. Um, there you can see some of the translucent pacifiers. This is a this is a um, company, Gray Feather Toys. They went out of business probably 20, well no, let's say 15 years ago. And um I have a lot of other toys, and so I kind of, instead of putting more stuff on there, um, on the chain, like some people say, to put PVC on it or whatever, just make sure that it's out of the way that the bird can't reach it or get caught. You can take beads. These are actually all extras off of some toys, and I made Sammy just a little translucent toy there. And... Um, you can hang you can hang those if the hole is big enough. You can put them on chains, or you can hang your toys um, on paper, which I paper rope, which I do a lot. Or uh, my customers are familiar with the wooden toys I sent out that are on the leather. You could restring on the leather. Those are all safe, and you can reuse your your beads and stuff to make toys. And I was going to take more pictures. The Sammy was a little aggravated, so um, we decided we would do it another day. But in the background, you can see that, again, she's got her perch that she's standing on. She has to climb off that to get the chihuahua perch behind her. And then she has a swinging, um, you know, her little swing up top that she, that she goes on quite a bit. So if you're wondering how to choose toys or what kind of toys are out there, as I said, there's a lot of uh, webinars um, that, that I've done on Lefebvre's YouTube channels. Uh, I also have them posted on my Gray Parrot Consulting. All of them are published there as well, and you'll be able to tell which is the toy ones. As far as toy boxes and such, toys on the bottom of the cage. Now, I could never quite understand why Sam um, did not really play with a lot of toys when they were hanging. I tried putting them in the middle of the cage, on the side of the cage. Um, I took them apart, and then I started hanging them towards the bottom of the cage. So she can actually stand on the bottom of the cage and, and chew them. And I found out she likes the toys down there more than anything. She can have a toy hanging from the top of her cage for months. I put it down there, you know, where she could reach it from the floor. And she's all over it within days. So you can, you know, take the pieces, you know, put them down there, see how they react. Emma will go on the cage bottom. Uh, Abigail does not like to. Um, Sterling will on occasion. Sydney will not. So they're all individuals. You have to find out what your bird likes, but this is all stuff to keep them busy in the cage. Now, this was after the toy hanger was kind of destroyed. It went down the bottom and all different, there's a little foot toy in there. 
all the different pieces of other toys could get put into this foot, uh, the little toy box. And that could be on the bottom of the cage. Just make sure that they don't poop on it because they're great for aiming. So that guy and enjoyed the entire box down to nothing. <laughs> Another thing you could do is you can use the third food dish on the cages. A lot of them um, come with three dishes. People aren't sure what to put in the third dish. Some people put chop or whatever in there or their dinners. Again, I don't like to offer the, the mushy stuff um, inside the cage because it's harder to clean. I'll take them out on their stand so I have an extra third cage. So they all have what I call toy boxes, all their pieces of toys and stuff that they can chew on and mainly throw for me to pick up and put back uh, all goes into that third food dish. And it's usually the one on the other side of the cage. So, you know, they're not dunking it in their water. So when you're looking for food dishes, this is another thing. A lot of times people will get the wrong dishes for the birds. And I only picked this because of the species that is posted on the side of this box. Um, the two ounce is going to be more for your canaries, your finches, um, maybe your parallettes. So you, you really need to be careful when you don't look just at the picture on the box to say, oh, my bird can use this. That, you know, use a little bit of common sense and realize, well, my bird can't stand on that. Um, perch that's there because there's actually a perch that's attached to that cup as well they they physically cannot stand on that perch and then get their head in that cup it's just entirely too small so there's different kinds of perches that are out there and that giant yellow one is there because actually that is sam's toy box on the bottom of her cage so um and she takes that thing she carries it all around the bottom of the cage with her with all her toys in it takes all her toys out, puts all her toys back in. She's a, she's a very proper little birdie. And so that, that works wonderful as a toy box. If your bird is throwing the, um, the um, bowls that are in the cages, could be your bird is bored. Um, so there's other options for dishes if you look into them. And another thing you could do is if they are throwing their, their, bowls out of boredom you can also take a toy that you know, like an acrylic toy that, that's not going to be bothered if it gets wet you could put it there to try to deter the bird from throwing them out um but you have to be careful and make sure you get the correct size bowls okay so here we have petrie and this is a perfect example of him being able to sit on his perch and reach his bowls that's how they're supposed to be they shouldn't have to stretch they shouldn't have to do anything. Um, it's, that's a very good common setup there. And you could see he's got other perches hanging in the back, background there where he has to climb from one to one for more exercise. The, the cage substrate. We've been through this, you know, quite often. So um, there's a lot of different things out there. And again, I didn't sell everything in the store. I sold the safe stuff in the store. So what I'd really like to see is you using um, paper is going to be the best. You can use newspaper, obviously. But the only problem with newspaper is that if your bird is not feeling well, you can't really tell if there's anything wrong with the poop because it's either on pictures and inks running or, you know, if you have plain unprinted newspaper or newsprint, excuse me. It's a lot easier to monitor their poops to make sure everything's fine. Um, it'll be easier to see if there's an incident. If they broke a blood feather, you'll be able to see it a lot better on there. So that's the, an excellent thing to do is, you know, make sure that you can see everything that's going on. Full spectrum lighting. Again, we're going in. We're not just blinging inside the cage. We're doing the environment. So a lot of people ask me about full spectrum lighting. At this point, I do not sell it anymore. So I'm not going to tell you what product would be the best. What I would suggest is you discuss it with your veterinarian as part of your wellness plan. Now, this is from Dr. Laura Wade. She has a, um, a, an article she wrote on this, and it's excellent for you to read and for you to talk to your own vet about. It tells you 
um, what products she uses and how often you should use it. A lot of people will buy these um, these lamps. Some of them are using reptile lamps. Some are just going to Home Depot. These are not the appropriate things. If you're going to go out and spend the money, make sure you're getting the right one for what you need. Talk to your vet and see what they prefer. Um, there's a lot of different companies out there. I only dealt with one. Um, that was what I used before I built my bird room. But I don't want to have them hanging two stories tall now because it's not going to be beneficial to me if I ever move the cages. I'm going to have holes in the ceiling two stories up I'll never be able to get to. Mm -hmm. So speak to your vet and discuss if your species, some species, they say, uh, as the African greys do need um, the UV lighting um, to help with everything as compared to, say, an Amazon or a macaw. So talk to, talk to your vet and see what you can come up with. Cage placement is important. Ideally, they should be exposed to direct sunlight, as I was saying in the last slide, to get vitamin D D3 and to keep their bones strong and their feathers healthy. It plays a big role in keeping the birds healthy overall. And though I have a lot of windows there, doesn't mean that they're getting the full spectrum lighting that they need. So we try to go out quite often. Um, if you are in a home, um, you are able to open a window. With it. I don't have screens in mind, so they have a better view. It's kind of hot down here in South Carolina. We either go from cold to hot, and we don't open the windows too much. So I took the screens out so they would have a better view. And so if you do have the screens in there and you can open them up and get some fresh air, fresh air in there and some uh, unobstructed sunlight, that's great. If not, you should take them out, um, make sure they're protected, whether they're in a carrier. Um, I prefer a carrier over really anything else. Um, you can use a small cage as long as it's uh, you have it all zip tied together so it's not going to fall apart when you pick it up. Um, that's all great ways, um, but your cage placement plays a big part in your, your overall um, attitude with the bird. So if you're in, they're in a room like this and they're looking out the windows, they can see the birds, they can see the butterflies, they can see the leaves going by. And it, again, it's entertainment, it's enrichment, and it keeps them busy. If you have them in a dark room, a dark paneled room, or you know a back bedroom with not any windows, and you throw a couple toys in there, and you're wondering why your bird is screaming, um, because it, you know it, they may not be the right toys, um, and they're social animals, so they want to be watching things that go around. So the cage placement is important. If you can have them semi by a window, now again, my guys don't stay in that room all the time they have a sleep room um so that room is good for during the day in the evenings when they come out that's all fine and dandy at night they go into a room that i can control a little bit better there's not a lot of windows i don't have to worry about lights going by to wake them up or somebody walking by to see them or lightning scaring them so if they are by a window make sure they have a little spot they can get away say if there's a hawk outside and it spooks them make sure there's a little part of a wall where the bird can get behind the wall versus having to stand fully in the line of a hawk so here we have uh jazzy and little man and this you'll see a little statue here kind of towards the bottom left that is a lamp that is not little man little man's up on top of the cage right here so um you can see where he's located he's located by a window so and you can see all his perches in there you can see how his toys are hung his little his little bowls so he's got a great setup there so there's no reason why he could not be in his cage and be happy and uh jazzy's over here on the stand jazzy just took a flight out there to see little man um jazzy has another spot in the house as well so, but again, here we have Petey's in the background there. He's got a nice unobstructed view. She's got curtains that she can close at night in case there's a hawk or lightning or anything else going on. So um, Bubba is on um, her hand right here, down here in the corner, uh, bottom right corner. That's um, the one we brought down from New York. 
So he's happily situated down in Florida now. Bathing options is another important thing. A lot of people say, well, my birds all jump into their, their bowls and they make a mess. Well, that's because naturally they have to bathe. So you can see I have a Corel dish down there. And I put them in there on Sundays and I should do it often. Well, if I put it down there on a Wednesday, I, I swear they know it's not Sunday and they won't take a bath. We just went through it the other day. Everybody had their baths in there and no one wanted to take it, no matter what I tried to encourage it. But this is something we have to optimize and use so they can be in their cage and be having fun. Another thing you can use, and again, here, here's a view looking down in Abby's cage. You can see all her perches, how she has to climb around. Um, you can see the various per uh, toys that she has in there and how I have them hung. Um, another thing you can do uh, to, to bling out that cage is cage heaters. There's different types that are out there. These are the ones I prefer. And yes, it does get cold in South Carolina. So I have these cage heaters up um, pretty much from October. Mine are still up now. I'll be taking them down shortly. But that is a nice little, um, nice little addition because if they are a little chilly, they can get up underneath there and they can be comfortable. So that's what being in the cage is all about for them to be comfortable, independent, have their own time. And then you want to think outside the cage. What else is in that room that they can watch, such as the windows and everything that's going on outside? If you think outside the cage, you just don't want to leave them in a, a quiet environment because it's really not quiet where they come from. Um, they're always making noises and they're talking to, you know, whoever they're with. So uh, I believe um, they have the TV on here and the birds watching the TV. Here, I know for a fact, um, Sophia is watching a video. Let's see if we can get it to go. And you can see that she is entertained by the stuff that's going past on, on the screen. So if you have a TV in the room, you can have that on while they're in their cage. You can certainly do that. You can have the radio going. Yes, this one's outside the cage, but my guys have their radio going whenever i'm not in there or whenever they're not out this is little max oops so he's having fun they do, they do that in the cage as well my guys really get going but every time i do that facebook um flags me for the music in the back so they take my music out um then here we have special needs this is ZZ, and ZZ has had some leg problems in the past. So um, it's a little gray, a little Timna, and the leg kind of sticks out towards the back, towards the tail, and off to the side. So he needs a special little way to get around in here. So this is a, more like a little small animal hutch. You can see the bowls in there are in, inside the cage or down the bottom. The bottom is lined so because he's laying on his stomach a lot of the time. So he can move around. He's got his, his ladders to pull himself around. Um, he's got the boxes to elevate the ladders up so he can stay flat. So this is this is somebody that's really gone um, out of their way to make sure the, their little gray is well taken care of and comfortable. And he can come, you know, come and go as he wants. He's not really getting any farther because if he falls off the box, um, he can't really go very far. So they got to put him back up. Now, this one is adorable, and I just had to put this in there because it shows you that they can make toys out of anything. So it's up to us to make sure that they are entertained, and I hope that's what you're taking away from this, this webinar. So here we go. I want to thank this family for their service, and, and obviously Charlie's having fun. Yeah. Oh, I'm trying to get the video to go. Yeah. Can you hear the music? No, but I could, yeah, you can see him moving. Oh, that's funny. He's giving him like a neck massage. <laughs> and we'll try it one more to see if we get the sound. All right, because usually the second time the sound plays. Oh, I think he's going to break that, that little wire. <laughs> 
Okay, so our goal is to make the cage a fun and safe place to be. Make it relaxing. Just like I said, we have our own favorite spot. We want to be, you wouldn't see me necessarily sitting there with a cup of coffee. I'd have a glass of wine, but is a place we all go to relax and we want to make sure that the bird has its own spot where it feels safe, where it wants to be, where it's content, just like that picture showing you. We want to make sure that the cage is a pleasant place to be. Don't look at it as punishment. We should never use it as punishment. Um, and we should make sure that we gently guide them to being um, good little parrots um, and wanting to be in their cage and wanting to be social and being independent versus always being honest because that's not realistic and that causes problems. So I usually end with this, but I'm going to end with one more thing today because it was made for me by Neil. So here you go. <laughs> Does anybody have any questions? <laughs> Let me get out of here and. Let's see. Okay. Okay, that's really funny. Uh, yes, we do have we do have a few questions for you, Lisa. Um, let's see. How about uh, Lisa? Uh, Susan wants to know what do you think of, about bottle brush purchase? Actually, they're very good. Um, there was a company that used to make them uh, down in Florida, and he's gone uh, out of business or sold the business, or he's hard to get hold of. Um, they're a little harder to disinfect. That's what I personally found. So you want to make sure if you have something that's made of that um, short term, I'm sure it'd be an excellent opportunity for the for it to be in the cage for the bird to chew on um, because they can debark it and they have fun with that. Um, but again, if it's pooped on, you're, you, you really need to back up because that's going to be hard to clean. Okay. Uh, and someone asked, Lisa wants to know... Uh where you got the unicorn pinata from um actually that's from one of my distributors um have her reach out to me it's um it's fetch it pet but i think they sell to stores so you know you can have her reach out to me and i could hook her up okay uh i've seen those at, at target do you know if those are I mean, very similar. I thought, I, you wouldn't know the, the components as well, right? Is it I'm, correct? I, I don't know. Yes, I've seen them at the dollar store. I've seen them at different places. I tend to always go to a bird toy distributor um, just because I figure it's their responsibility to know where it's coming from. And, you know, it's tried and true. You know, they've been selling them for years. So if there was an issue, we would know versus somebody going to me going to dollar general and buying one bringing it home and saying well here have it hopefully it's the same and there's nothing you know in it that could hurt your bird yes oh and if you were to um have a bird safe pinata what would you put in it <laughs> would you fill it with any well yeah actually that on the butt they have um the unicorns they have pinatas they have parrots um the, the donkey and the unicorn right by their butt has a little thing you lift up you can put nuts in there. You can put dried fruit. You don't want to put anything mushy because it's only going to mold. Um, you can put, you know, a couple seeds or a couple pellets or a couple nutri berries in there. And um, yeah. And then when they chew the side off of it, you'll still have the little legs where the little treats can fall into. So they got to dig in there. And actually, I'll put toy pieces in there too, stuff them back in there. So they have those hanging on the side of the cage too to pull stuff out of. Oh, very cool. Okay. Um, and, and speaking of uh, safe bird, uh, bird products, uh, can you throw out some companies that you, you believe like you feel comfortable with the safe toys? That some. Um, yeah, I, oh, well, I use a lot of, um, off the top of my head, I use a lot of Mighty Bird. Um, they've been a distributor of mine for quite a long time. Um, I like Mighty Bird. I like Parrot Treasures. Um, I use a lot of Kitech, Fun Max. Um, uh, grams I use. I'm trying to think. Superbird. Um, see, my distributors that I go through, they have I have access to thousands of toys, and but I don't. If I see something, if I'm buying it for somebody, I will make sure it's a safe toy. Versus, oh look, it's a new toy. Let's try this. You know what I'm saying? 
So these companies come out with new toys all the time. I might be, you know, more, a little bit more old fashioned, but I also want to make sure that everybody's safe. So I, I bought toys um, in the store when they arrived from various people as I was learning. And actually they ended up in the garbage. I didn't sell them. I didn't even want to donate them because they were just unsafe. Wow. So and it was a learning process for me not to buy them again. So you had to be careful buying, um, you know, on these big mega sites, you know, that don't tell you where the toys are coming from. Um, you have to be careful because they might have an African gray sitting next to this great big toy. And when you get the toy, it's, you know, it's her finch. So, you know, you, and the wiring is, you know, more like something you'd wire an earring on versus something that you would hang, you know, in bird to in bird cage. Okay. Good point. Good point. And then, um, so Diane, Diane asks, this will probably our last question. Uh, what do you think about toys and springtime breeding behavior? So we're kind of that time right now. Um, do you take the one chosen? Do you take the toy that's chosen for a sexy time out of the cage for the duration of it? Do you introduce something else? Um, try to keep them occupied with foraging or other things to try. So. Yes. Well, Sam thinks her bell's really sexy this time of, time of year. And um, I, she has a little stainless steel tube bell and she feeds that. So um, I'll go in there and I'll tell her to stop. And she, she usually does. But if she goes in there and I catch her again, I take the toy out of the cage. I might put it back in another two days and watch her. Um, but you don't, especially with like um, the, the nesting materials, anything like that. You, you know, if you see your bird, it's specifically pulling a piece of this toy off and going down there in a the corner and tucking it in, you might want to take that toy out. Um, if you see that he's, they're becoming a little bit aggressive, say with, you know, a lot of the stain, I use a lot of stainless steel stuff. If they could see themselves in the stainless steel, either they might think it's a mate or they might think it's another bird. They get a little bit aggressive. Yes, I will take that out. Okay. All right. I think that's all we have time. Wow. We blew through these, uh, this, this, this hour just went flying by. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> Uh, let's see. I have a couple announcements. Um, I got announced today as a winner. Um, we have our giveaway winner um, who is going to receive a bag of Lefebvre pellets, um, the, stand, the the groundbreaking diet that came out 50 years ago. <laughs> um, and um, uh, So that is going to go out to Angela Renz. I'm not sure if it's Renze or Renz, but congratulations, Angela. Uh, you'll be contacted to uh, send out a bag of Lefebvre pellets as well as another uh, Lefebvre product of your birch choice. So congratulations on that. And then, um, sorry, if, if you had a question about food today, you might want to especially pay attention to next Friday because we're going to be on with Dr. Lamb. Um, she's going to be covering um, her episode of Avian Vet Insider is going to cover free feeding or meals. What is best for parrots? So if you want to... Um, learn about the major benefits of free feeding, uh, why it fits more with their physiology versus, um, I guess, having more like scheduled meal times. So that'll be interesting. And that'll be with Dr. Lamb um, on May 2nd. That's already ne next Friday. <laughs> Same time as this time, 12 uh, Pacific Standard Time if you're on my, my coast. All right. Um, wow. Well, Lisa, uh, we'll be on with you again. Um, well, actually you'll be, you'll be laying, laying a hand behind the scenes on the, our next couple of webinars, right? Yep. So I will go. be here, but I will not be sitting on the floor. <laughs> Can't even tell. <laughs> so, um, all right, everybody. Uh, once again, thanks for joining us. Um, hope everyone has a great weekend. Um, a great Cinco de Mayo. <laughs> Margarita. <laughs> um, and until next time, uh, everyone stay safe. Have a great weekend and all the best to you and your flock. Until next time. Bye. Bye.